Learn that by humble reverence, by inquiry and by service, the men of wisdom who have seen the truth will instruct you in knowledge. Shri Krishna shows us in this verse how one can attain wisdom. First of all, reverence is needed and then inquiry and then service. Scrum scriptures change this around and say that humble reverence is always needed and that service should come next and only then can one make inquiries. You should first fall at the feet of some great personality and surrender yourself as their disciple. You should serve them, give your love and remain close to them. Only then can you ask them questions. There are three ways of attaining wisdom and if you do these three things, the man, men of wisdom who have seen the truth will instruct you in wisdom. Notice that Shri Krishna says that only people who have seen the truth, the seers, these people will give you wisdom. So you're recording this as a new one, yeah? Okay. The first thing that is required is humble reverence. You should respect such a great personality with faith and devotion. Humility is the first thing that is needed for wisdom. A person that is not humble can never attain wisdom. If a pitcher is empty and one wishes to fill it with water, then it's not enough that the person goes to the river. You'd have to lean down in order to get water from the river into the pitcher. The funny thing is that the pitcher only needs to lean down as the river does everything else for it. A pitcher cannot get water from the river by itself. It leans down and the river fills it up with water. If the pitcher is not ready to lean down, then it will float on the river throughout the duration of its life and remain empty without even a drop of water falling inside it. It's a very great thing to bow down. It's only also funny that when the river fills the pitcher up, then the river does not lose anything from this process. If you look at it materially, then you'll see that the water in the river has decreased because it has given some of its water to the pitcher. The river does not think that it has lost anything because it only has to give. If the river does not give any water to the pitcher, they will have to give it to the sea in the end anyway. The water does not belong to the river and it is not going to stay in the river. The river has only to give and while it is giving, then it is all well because in the end has to go into the sea. If you go with humility to a wise person, then it does not make any difference to the wise person. The wise person thinks that as long as they have their body, their mind and their intellect, then all of this has been given from God's grace, the more they give away, the better. If one does not give away, then one has to go into the fire cremation ceremony in, in the end anyway. Once that happens, then nothing remains with them. He only wants to give away knowledge. The body is going into the fire cremation ceremony anywhere, and therefore the soul will have to go back to the Supreme Soul. He wants to give back everything that he has earned. Humility is a state of acceptance from us. Wherever we see great saints, wherever we meet great saints, we do so by touching their feet. It's a very symbolic thing. Who knows why we touch people's feet? Na dharma. Who knows? Our heads are fallen at the feet of great saints. The head represents the ego. What this gesture is saying, that one's own sense of greatness that is stored in one's head is now being placed at the feet of great saints and therefore when they complete, it's just because of this great saint. Therefore, how great must the saint be? One is placing their own sense of greatness at the great saint's feet. One is placing their own ego at the great saint's feet. This is what humble reverence is. It is an acceptance that you are empty and you want to be filled just like the picture. Humility is very difficult at the beginning. It's very difficult to bow down at the beginning. But once you bow down, then it becomes easy and this great bliss comes in bowing down. When the picture is empty, then it doesn't sink easily. But once it leans down and some water comes inside, then the water will keep pulling the pitcher down. When the pitcher is completely empty, then it does not bow down. In the same way, a person that is ignorant and egotistic has a lot of difficulties in bowing down. If you see a lot of people, then you see that they won't bow down. A lot of difficulties come from this. By bowing down, I do not mean bowing your head down. It's a receptability. You got a question? You got a question? Okay. When you invite people to go to a place where big yagna of wisdom is taking place, then they must say that have no need for something like this. This means that they are not ready to bow down. They say that they have no need for this because in reality they have nothing and therefore they are not ready to bow down. The moment one starts bowing down, 
then the water or wisdom will encourage one to bow down more often. You often see a pitcher full of water will go down and sit on a riverbed and that pitcher will never think about going all the way back to the top of the river. The more fruits that there are on a tree, then the more the tree starts bowing down. A tree empty of fruits will remain standing tall. This bowing down is a way of becoming filled. The world is ready to fill you, but are you ready to accept this? The more you become accepting, then the more you will bow down. It's a very great quality to be able to bow down. I often think that feet are even greater than the head, and that's why we place our feet, heads at the feet of people we respect. You often see that saints, wise people and great personalities have their knowledge in their heads, yet we bow down to their feet. We say that we fall at their feet, and we do not say we fall at their heads. In reality, Wisdom does not come from the feet, yet we fall at such people's, uh, we do not, and not fall at people's heads because wisdom beca begins at the feet of those saints, those wise people, and those great personalities, and that's humility. Second thing that's needed to attain wisdom is inquiry. The prefix body is given to that verse, to the word prashna in that verse. It's not just questions that are needed, that, but questions that develop oneself. There are different types of questions. Sometimes questions are born from a habit of asking questions. No matter what the answer is, the asker just feels good in asking questions. The asker finds out that you read good scriptures and begins asking questions such as, what is Brahman? Brahman is not party talk. You need to observe these people. The question is, what is Brahman? is such a great question, but in this case, the question comes deep in their minds and the question comes from a habit of asking questions. It's not a question that's asked after doing deep contemplation. Many people also ask others questions to test them. They want to fight, uh, fight, uh, find out if the person actually knows the answer to the question. The asker knows the answer, but wants to know if the person knows it or not. Do not ask a guru questions to measure him, but to attain him. Who are we to measure other people? The person who's there to measure people is sitting up there. Ask questions because you want to attain something or to understand something. It should be about something you're stuck about and you cannot make a decision about it with your intellect. Simply speaking, in computer language, it's when the data you have on your computer does not give you the answer to the question, and because the guru has a greater data collection and more experiences, you ask him. You should ask questions with a faith that you will benefit from the answers. This is the inquiries that Sri Krishna is referring to in that verse. The third thing that is needed to attain not wisdom is service. This is very important. Service is so important that in our scriptures, in ancient times, the fathers would go and leave their sons at the Guru's hermitage and they'll say that the sons are going there to study, but the fathers would tell them that they should go there to serve the Gurus. They would just have to serve the Gurus. The Gurus would decide what would be taught and the parents and the pupils had no say in this. Nowadays, a son would turn 10 and the father will say he wants to make him a doctor. The son gets a fit from looking at blood, but the father wants to make him a doctor. We cannot look at the capacity of the child. In ancient times, the fathers would leave this to the Guru. When fathers would introduce their sons to the Guru at the hermitage, then they would tell their sons just to serve the Guru. The Guru would teach the pupils what he thought was right and the good of the pupils would be in this. What happens because of service? I asked Jay this question and he got it right last time. People, they come, they think service is just Guru puts his two feet straight and the pupils are pressing each of the legs with their hands. This is not service. If this is done with love, then it's fine. And I'm not saying no to this, but this is not the service that Sri Krishna is talking about here in the Gita. Service is just a by the way thing so one can attain the truth and association with great saints. A person gets nearness and intimacy with great personalities. A guru is of everyone. A guru may have a thousand disciples and to stay with the, close with the guru, you must serve him. In ancient times, the gurus did not take anything and therefore you cannot dictate your own terms. Nowadays, people pay the college fees six months before starting school and the pupils tell the teacher that they paid the fees and therefore it's the duty to give the pupils their time. The gurus of ancient times were very clever and nowadays teachers have no intelligence. They take the fees from the beginning and get trapped into this. The gurus from ancient times did not want anything from the pupils and therefore the pupils had no egos. If the pupil gives something to the teacher from the beginning, then you have the ego that I've given something to the teacher. Whereas in ancient times, the pupil knew he was not doing anything to the teacher. 
In fact, the teacher was giving him everything. Therefore, the people had any question in his mind, and the only way he'll be able to ask it and become close to the Guru would be by serving the Guru, for example, by bringing him water. If the people brought water from the Guru, then he'd pour water in the Guru's gas and give this to the Guru while he was thirsty. While the Guru would be drinking the water, the people would wait and take the glass from the Guru's hands when the Guru finished drinking the water. He would therefore attain close proximity to the Guru. The giving of the glass of water is not the service, it is the close proximity that is the service. In this close proximity, the pupil keeps learning things from the Guru. The Guru's whole life is a yajna of wisdom. The pupil will learn how the Guru sits, gets up, talks to people and all the activities the Guru does as well as how he does them. The people would remember many different events from the Guru's life and how the Guru reacted and responded to these. The people will want to see this and he will learn from this because of such a situation may even arise in the pupil's life. You will see how the Guru would take it if someone comes to the hermitage and behaves in a manner that the Guru does not like. The pupil wants to see all of this in his life the events, uh, in case these events take place in his life. The pupil will be able to learn from this and that's what service is for. Moreover, in close proximity, the pupil learns things from the Guru, but on the other side, the Guru is observing the pupil. When Guruji was very young, an elderly person told him that when he makes friends in the beginning, then when he meets them, everyone will look good, but if you stay for someone for 24 hours, then you'll realize what that person is like. Guruji once went on a school picnic where they had to stay overnight from Saturday night to Sunday evening. An elderly person told him that he'll see on this trip who his true friends are. When a child meets his friends at school, they all jump around in the playground, run around, play sports, they go back to study, go home and school finishes. From this, you cannot tell who your true friends are. You have to stay with them for 24 hours, then you would understand. In the same way, close proximity with the Guru leads to the Guru understanding the pupil and his behavior. And we express ourselves in so many ways. Our body language is so powerful that we do not say anything using words, but give such a strong message for our body language. A wise person has the ability to see through people. The pupil may keep something hidden deep inside, but the wise person finds out straight away what that thing is. They find out straight away what is in the pupil's mind and what feelings the pupil has. How can you hide something from a guru? A pupil wants to expose himself to the Guru by way of service so the Guru can find out this weakness and the Guru will tell him this. When a discourse is taking place, then a Guru is talking to several people, then the knowledge that Guru gives is indirect knowledge. It is very general knowledge because the Guru has to say what he does, taking into account there are a thousand people there. But the wisdom the Guru gives a pupil when a, when a, a pupil serves him is wisdom that the Guru is specifically giving to the pupil. It's to the pupil in particular, it's to gain this specific and personal knowledge that the pupil serves the Guru. If you are in close proximity with the Guru and you do something wrong, then the Guru will tell you that you should not have done that and he will tell you what you should have done instead. He will tell you, for example, how to fast, how to perform penances. He's telling this knowledge specifically to you. The close proximity to the Guru that you get through service is very important. You may not know it, but there are many knots existing in your subconscious mind. The Guru unties these knots. Sometimes the Guru unties these knots by telling the people some things clearly, and sometimes the pupil does not even know about it. The knots get untied, and the pupil realizes that it's only by staying in close proximity with the Guru that the knot was untied. The fault inside the pupil goes away, because the example is truly in front of him, and that is service. When there is close proximity, then the frequency of wisdom also increases. Wisdom is persistently given to the pupil. That is why Shri Krishna tells Arjun to gain wisdom through the three things. Information can come to you in many ways. You can get it from a book, audio CDs, video CDs, MP3 files, the internet. You can get, you can get all the information in the world, but you cannot call it wisdom until you have attained close proximity with a guru. The chemical reaction from the relationship between a guru and a pupil can only happen through this close proximity. That is why Shri Krishna says that three things are needed in order to attain wisdom. He says further that men of wisdom who have seen the truth will instruct you in wisdom. Not every person can therefore instruct you in wisdom. You need to have attained a certain level of yoga. Only a person who practices what he preaches 
and has experienced the truth can instruct you in wisdom. A person who has seen the truth and has attained both his self and his supreme being. Therefore, a person who experiences both his self and God can give you both clear and symbolic wisdom. What is wisdom of ourself? What relationship does one have with themselves? A person owned his shop and would leave his house every morning to real, reach the railway platform at 9 a.m. in a fixed compartment in which he would travel every day. He'd go to the carriage from underneath every single day. At 9 a.m., the train would come and a person who was sitting there in carriage would come out and he would see everyone coming on the train. He would go to the first person and ask him if he had change for £100 or £1. The person would give him back the change on these hundred pounds and the sec first and second days. On the fourth day, the man would ask the other person coming off how he was and whether he had changed for hundred pounds. This would continue taking place for 10 days and on the 10th day, the person coming off the train then replies by apologizing that he does not know the man and who he is. The man asks him how he can't recognize him because he's giving him change for 10 days. This is how they have a relationship. The other man replies that's fair enough before he asked him for change on the first day and he didn't know him but he knows him, you should know him by now but this is what wisdom of the self is when someone asks us who we are then we say for example I'm the wife of a doctor, I'm a husband of a doctor, I'm the son of a doctor but who were you before you became all of these things? before you were someone's son, you were someone else before you were someone's wife, you became someone's wife, you were something else before you were someone's husband, you were something else therefore the information we have about ourselves always starts halfway. It does not start from the beginning. Who are you? This is the true wisdom, to find out in reality who you are. If the husband dies tomorrow and the wife is still there, and if the wife dies tomorrow and the husband is still there, then who are you? You are there before your husband and your wife was there, and you will be there even after your husband or your wife are no longer there. Therefore, are you only a husband or a wife? Are you only someone's son or someone's daughter? Who are you? If someone is stuck in worldly relationships, then they're not able to guide you. You need to seek someone who has thought about who they are at an elementary level, who has made efforts on this path, and who has experienced the truth. Only such a person can show us the right way. The reason why it can instruct us in wisdom is that when one goes to the root, then they realize that nothing else is different. One who has experienced the soul realizes that his soul and your soul are the same. We are not different there and once this man of wisdom experiences this then he can guide you because everything at the same is the same at the root. It is all different in outside relations. If you are someone's husband then it does not mean that you are everyone's husband. If you are someone's son then it does not mean that you are everyone's son. You cannot be guided in that way but once you have realized the form of the soul then you will know that your soul and the souls of everyone are the same. There is no difference in these souls. The word used in front of uh, wisdom, knowledge in this verse, Tattva Dashi is very important. This means a person who has seen the truth. Only such a person can instruct you in wisdom. A person that has realized himself can instruct you in wisdom. The very nice verse in the Mahabharat, Yasya Nati Nija Pragna Kevalantu Bahoshta Najas Shanti Shastra Nanam Darvi Sup Rasam Iva, meaning a person that has no experience of his self and yet has heard and read a lot, such a person does not know the meaning of the scriptures. Just like a spoon that's been stirring in dal for ages and ages does not know about the taste of dal. If you put a spoonful of dal in your mouth, then you may like the taste of it, but if the spoon's lying in the dal, then it, you cannot know what the taste is like. You'll never be able to appreciate the taste of it because you've never experienced the taste. When a person has seen the truth, then what type of wisdom does he give you? There are even different types of wisdom. Shri Krishna shows us in the next verse what wisdom that person has seen the self will give you, okay?